Okay, we're recording now. And what we'll do is we'll just pick up where I left off last night. Um, I didn't get very far last night in terms of where I wanted to go with the text. Um, so we'll pick up at that point, which is trying to tie in again the, the incense and the Torah portion, the, the uh, bringing forth the idea we got last week from Tetzaveh about the incense, bringing it forward again into this Torah portion, and then expounding upon it a little bit because Kitisa is frequently associated with the Feast of Purim. Um, and last night we started to look at some of the similarities, and then in today's class, hopefully, we'll get through at least everything that I've picked out. We don't have time to do everything, but um, we can see some patterns in the Torah portion that are also uh, contained within the book of Esther or the scroll, accurately, it's a scroll of Esther or the Megillah. Um, and it's in that pattern that we can start to see the roots of Amalek because the roots of Amalek are not just in this Torah portion as it relates to the golden calf and spiritual authority, but as it goes all the way back to the garden and the issue of spiritual authority. So that's what we did last night. I tried to establish that foundation there in the garden and to try to explain why Yeshua says that the serpent was a murderer from the beginning. He started out that way because he couldn't tell the truth. Um, he could only tell the truth as formulated um, through the kind of a beast. And then last night, we, we linked it in there with the golden calf, and one of the anomalies in the text is we've got a subject and verb where it says Aaron saw, but it doesn't say exactly what he saw. We have context to get an idea of what he might have seen that provoked him to build the altar and to establish a feast day for the golden calf. Um, and the rabbis uh, teach that what Aaron saw was that the calf seemed to come to life. Life seemed to have been breathed into it somehow. And so when we get over to the book of Revelation and we also see an image that seems to take on life, even though it's a deceit, many people will be deceived by it. By the same token, many people were deceived by the golden calf. Whether it literally came to life or not, we don't really know. The text doesn't explicitly tell us. But the book of Revelation explicitly tells us that there is an event like that that we can expect that is rooted in this tradition about the golden calf. So that's where we'll pick up. And let me see, make sure I'm not sharing the Passover menu. slide. There we go. All right, and again, this sort of portion is not necessarily in a chronological order. Um, sometimes we can see events seem to be out of place, like in, in last week's tour portion, we saw this, uh, this taking up of goods for the tabernacle. And then here we're going to see the error when Moses goes up the mountain. So obviously there's some time things out of place here. Uh, but as we get over into Kitisa, um, we see that there's been this error with the golden calf. And eventually the people are going to want to atone for that sin. Um, they recognize that what they did was wrong. Um, we get the addition in the Torah portion of the copper labor. Let's see. There's a lot in this portion that we're not going to have time to cover. Um, but again, the idea of the copper labor truly doing um, a self-examination. We get 
in this particular Torah portion, the eighth day of Pesach. I don't know if you've ever noticed that there's an eighth day of Pesach and it's not added on to the end like it is at Sukkot. It's actually embedded into the beginning because um, in chapter 34, verse 25, it says, you shall not slaughter, slaughter the blood of my offering upon chametz and you shall not leave overnight until the morning to slaughter the Pesach festival. So the idea there is the chametz actually has to be cleaned out before you can slaughter that lamb. So it's being slaughtered on that pre-day. <laughs> it's like the eighth day that occurs before number one. Um, but as we're looking at the, the number of days, it's going to add up to eight that we're required uh, not to have chametz in the house. So you've got that kind of more of a hidden eighth day in Pesach, but it's more apparent in Sukkot. But going back to the golden calf, we see that there's going to be a sense in Israel that they need to atone for that grievous sin. And eventually it's going to lead to a day of atonement because uh, Moses is going to have to, you know, do the cleanup after the golden calf incident. He's going to have to go back up the mountain. He's going to have to stay there an additional 40 days. He's going to have to fast an additional 40 days and 40 nights. And um, then he's going to have to come back down with a second set of tablets that this time he had to inscribe them as they were dictated. They weren't literally written with the finger of Adonai like the sapphire tablets were that he broke. Um, he's going to have stone tablets. And eventually that's in that time period, it's going to lead to the Day of Atonement. And that kind of answers the question that I posed last night. Is all gold good? And the answer is no, because the gold is only a physical substance like an animal that represents the heart of the person who brings it. So the gold that you bring is only as good as your heart. And so, you know, when people say, well, he just has a heart of gold. That's a good thing. You want people to say that about you because it represents uh, a purity of heart that's so transparent that even other people can see that inside of you because they see it through your deeds. The gold is just the physical medium. And so in Kitisa, we saw that contrast. We have the good gold of Genesis 2. We have prophecy there and we have potential. If we're the filling stones that we should be, we have the potential to fill up that good gold. But in Kitisa, we had bad gold feasting. We had a feast for a golden calf. We pinned the name on the golden calf and thought that that would be acceptable enough but it was a direct transgression. There was a transgression of a direct commandment. You can't do that. <clears throat> so as we pull that theme over into Purim or into the scroll of Esther, as we start off, we see again a, a king having a feast. And this is going to make sense in a minute when we go into Ezekiel. Because ultimately our problems in the garden, the corruption of the gold, um, the corruption of spiritual authority in the garden, uh, we can trace it back to the serpent. Like Yeshua said, that he had a murderous plan from the beginning. And he didn't just force us out of the garden, deceive us out of the garden. He killed us at the same time. Because when we fell out of the garden, we were no longer immortal. And so again, murder was the plan, Yeshua says, from the beginning. And he says, when you have that mind in you of the serpent, that's why you can't hear truth. When you can't hear what scripture is saying, it's because you have the mind of the serpent active in you. And it's those sorts of thoughts and plans and that type of cunning it's not the spirit of wisdom from above. It's that sort of animal cunning that leads to death, that leads to murder. 
and it was very easy to do. He just used words. He didn't have to make a club out of the tree branch. He didn't have to go dig iron out of a hill and sharpen it into a knife. He didn't have to make a bow and arrow. He just used words and we killed ourselves. So when we're deceived in that way, or when we say we're helpless against temptation, and last night I brought out the fact that naked in context often means helpless. And so when we say we're helpless, when we're at the mercy of our appetite, emotion, desire, and intellect, and then we're killing ourselves. That's what's happening. The snake is smart. He doesn't have to directly attack you with the weapon. He just brings words and makes you commit suicide with your behavior. And so in the, the scroll of Esther, we've got a, a story that starts off where a, a king is doing this excessive feasting inappropriate feasting. And in the commentary, they say that it's um, believed that he took out the sacred objects that had been captured from the temple, and that he put on the robes of the high priest, and he pulled out the sacred vessel vessels of the temple, and was using them in this feast. It was kind of a mockery of the temple service. So he's, the king is actually masquerading um, dressing up as someone he isn't. And as we look at the Holy of Holies, and, and that's the whole idea with Purim is masquerading. Who are you portraying yourself to be? Started back in the garden. Who does the snake try to pass himself off as? Somebody who's actually interested in your spiritual development? No, his plan is murder. So his masquerade works. In the Holy of Holies, though, it's also a hidden place. And only one person can enter it, and that person can enter it only with incense and blood. And we know that Yom HaKippurim, which is the full name of the feast day, which is a day we feast on um, repentance, on prayer, and on charity. Those are the three things that it's typically boiled down to. We don't eat physical food. Um, we focus on the food that is, is not physical. You're fasting the physical and feasting in the spiritual realm. Purim is a day like Purim. Yom HaKippurim is a day like Purim. I'm sorry. And we know that Yom HaKippurim came first, and Purim came later. But again, smichut, how you place the words, what they mean to one another. Can you truly understand Yom HaKippurim without the story of Purim, or can you understand the story of Purim without Yom HaKippurim? Probably not, not completely. And so Yom HaKippurim is going to be a day like Purim in some respect, because that spirit of Amalek that was in wicked Haman, may his name be blotted out, it's ancient. It goes back to the garden. It goes back to those murderous intentions. Nothing's going to be exactly as it appears in the story of Purim. Like, is she Esther or is she Hadassah? She dresses as a queen when she goes into the king, but she's not yet a queen. She could come out just a concubine. Esther and Mordechai, the text is a little ambiguous. Are they Jewish or are they Benjamite? Yes. <laughs> There's an intersection there that we'll look at, and they're living in Persia. And, and um, under that... Um, kingdom authority. Was Hadassah or Esther a wife or was she an adulteress? Because that's what the king thinks is going on. He thinks Haman is assaulting her when he comes back in from his rage. There's these little question marks like what exactly is going on here? Um, and of course we know these questions are established, the answers are established for us. But still, if we were in the story, 
we would have question marks as the story unfolded. And it goes, the roots of it go all the way back to Jacob masquerading as Esau. Because remember, Rachel prepares two goats, two kids. She only needs one to prepare Isaac a meal, but she selects two. Because remember, it says there's two nations in your womb. That was uh, told to Rebecca. Excuse me, I didn't say Rachel. Rebecca. So she prepares the two goats. And she directs Jacob to take the meal into his father, masquerading as Esau, so much so that he's, he's putting on goat skins to pass himself off as a beast. So we've got a lot of Yom Kippur pictures there. And this is pointed out, just to show you the how the uh, Yom Kippur ceremony and the book of Esther are tied together linguistically. It says each time the word poor, which is lot, is used in Esther, the text will also explain that the poor is a type of lottery. In Hebrew it's goral. And the word goral is used only twice in the Torah in the same verse. It's referring to the service that's performed on Yom Kippur. And the verse discusses the lots that were drawn to identify which goat would be for God and which would be for Azazel. So you've got one Ladonai, you've got one Lazazel. One is the blood's going to be offered in the Holy of Holies. The other one is basically going to be stoned because remember stoning meant being pushed off a cliff. And then if the person wasn't dead yet, then you finished them off with stones. Um, so in essence, the scapegoat, even though it represented evil, it still became part of the process of purification. Because it's only when that scapegoat takes the sins away that we can declare that Israel has now been, their sins have been destroyed for another year. So as we look at Haman, and last night we looked at the first mention of Haman's name back in Genesis 3, where he's saying, did Elohim saying, did you eat of the tree? And he says, uh, Hamin ha'etz. And you can read that as Haman, as a hint. Haman the tree. Haman wants to be the tree. But the downside of being the tree when Haman is the tree, or the serpent is the tree, is that it's a tree of confusion between the knowledge of good and evil. They can never be the tree of life, and they know that. But they're fine if they're the tree of confusion. And so the pattern is that, is that the Holy One will take the one who has been that messenger or that vehicle of evil, of murderous intention and transgression, and somehow that same beast, object, person, will actually become a means of deliverance. Just like we see um, Haman, even though he intended to murder Mordechai and hang him on a gallows, he ends up hanging on his own tree. He's going to take the tree, Haman the tree. He's going to take the tree, says, oh, I'll get Mordechai hanged. He ends up on it. And so Haman is going to be designated for destruction in Avadon instead of Mordechai in place of. Just like the scapegoat, you've got the two goats. Without the scapegoat, we don't have that, that object on which to project the sin to carry it off. The same thing with Haman. He's functioning in that realm. That the sin, the evil, the wickedness that was decreed can be put onto Haman and he can be the one sent off and basically pushed off the cliff, so to speak. So let's look at Revelation 12, 7 through 12. That says there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, the dragon and his angels. 
waged war and they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. So Revelation is bookending what we read about in Genesis 3. This is the bookend for that event and Revelation. Where was the serpent of old strolling around to begin with? In the lower garden. Where is he strolling around now? Well, he's either in the lower or the upper garden. I haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, because if he's accusing before the throne, it would actually be an, at an even higher level. Uh, so his job, um, remember, you've got a job. Even if it's an evil one, you can fill the earth and subdue it like a precious stone. Or you can fill the earth with violence, which is what the serpent did. And that's what he's been doing. He's been deceiving the whole world, filling it with violence. It says he was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, now the salvation and the power, and I think that says kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah, his anointed one. And we get the principle of anointing in Kitisa, by the way, um, especially with the mixing of the spices that goes into that anointing oil for the priesthood and for the vessels and the furniture of the tabernacle. But the focus there is on the authority of his Mashiach. Back at the beginning, when the serpent deceived the whole world, which consisted of two people, it was about authority. He didn't want to be ruled over by the human being. But now it says the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Mashiach, his anointed one, and anointing denotes authority. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses him before our God day and night. And so again, what is Satan's job? His job is to slander and accuse. And it says, and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you. Having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. So there's a lot going on in just a few verses here. We see that, yes, we already have authority in Yeshua HaMashiach, but there will come a point when that authority will be certified as having come. That there's going to be a dismissal of the serpent. There's going to be a dismissal of his accusations. He's lost the power to accuse and to slander. And that's what he was from the beginning. He was a slanderer. He was a murderer. He murdered people with his words. And he's going to be thrown down. He will no longer be able to accuse the brethren. Now, I don't know that it means he won't be able to accuse anybody else. Because we don't have a context for him not being able to accuse someone who's guilty. But that might be a different discussion. But how did they overcome him? How did they overcome his testimony? His deceiving testimony. How did they overcome that? The word of their testimony and the blood of the lamb. So you see how the blood of the lamb, that power of Yeshua, the anointing of Yeshua, plus the word of the testimony, which we know is the word itself, the Torah, the Bible, how do we overcome the accuser? When we begin living mindfully the word of our testimony, then what will he accuse us of? Because we're fulfilling our role as precious stones, as the fiery stones 
whose roots had gone up into the garden because that was our job from in the beginning to fulfill the garden, to fill the earth and subdue it and to be able to pass freely between those two realms and maintain immortality in passing between the physical and the spiritual. But he says, a time of woe is coming because now the devil has come down. He's got great wrath and he knows time is short. Where is the context for that? Let's see if we can find it. It says on, um, again, on Yom Kippur, just a reminder from last week that the incense is mixed with helbona. This stinky incense that it becomes transformed when it's mixed with other spices. That process that it's representing, we know it has to start, our sinful acts are like the helbona. And when we begin to do tshuva, which we will do when we read the word, or when somebody speaks the word to us, and we learn the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots, when we start to learn what it means to live in the garden. Those are garden rules. And when we realize we've transgressed a garden rule, we want to prepare ourselves for the resurrection. And so we begin to do tshuva. We begin to repent. We say, okay, the Bible says I should be doing this, and I haven't been doing it. The Bible says I shouldn't be doing that, but I've been doing it. I have to repent of that. I acknowledge my sin. And so I take the word of my testimony, my words, my prayers of repentance. Often I will take tzedakah, which is charity, which is like proof of my sincerity. I will give to the poor, as it says in the prophets. That's the proper fast. Uh, to take care of someone else, to show compassion on someone else. If I'm expecting compassion for me and my sin, then would I not in turn show compassion to someone else? And so you've got repentance, you've got prayer, you've got charity. You begin modeling the behavior that you're requesting from the Holy One. Forgiveness, compassion. And so what's going to happen is not only do you have that burning up, the smoke going up on the brazen altar, he'll take those coals, he'll add the incense there again of repentance, and he will go in, and there's another transformation that's going to occur at the golden altar. You're getting closer to the presence. And finally, he's going to take that incense one day out of the year, and he's going to go into the Holy of Holies where he can request the forgiveness of sin for the entire nation, even the stinky people. If we've been a stinky person and we're part of Israel, then the sin is atoned for as long as we have gone through that commanded process of tshuva. And then it's sweetened, and the very stinky thing we did is now a sweet thing. It smells good. It's been completely transformed which we can't even imagine. It's, we can say it, but you can't wrap your mind around the stinkiest thing you've ever smelled becoming the sweetest thing you've ever smelled just because you repented. So similarly, we see Mordechai and Esther. They're going to take Haman's evil, stinky plan, and they're going to have a plan to turn it into royal favor, grace, and glory. And you know what? Remember back here where it says they did not look their life even when faced with death? We all know what Esther's famous for saying. If I perish, I perish. I love my people more than my life. And that's what goes back to on Yom Kippur, it's at a ka, charity. It's being conscious of the other person, that you don't stand alone on Yom Kippur. You stand with the entire nation of Israel. And those who are willing to lay down their lives for the community, for the greater good of the community, for those who are willing to say, if I perish, I perish. If I give up my own comfort, my own comfort zone, my own safety, my own security, if I see myself as part of a nation rather than as an individual who can run and hide, Mordechai warns Esther, he says, you, you're not going to be able to hide. 
you're still going to perish if you try to hide, if you try to masquerade in that way. But we can flip this script here that Haman has devised and the very stinky murderous plan that he has can be turned into royal favor and glory and grace. And this is the attitude of a Benjamite. Um, and you can see how everything was flipped. The gallows that he had planned for Mordechai, he gets hung on it. All the, the wealth, that Haman desires and all the royal favor and all the attention and all the, the hero worship, his stuff gets given to Esther and Mordechai basically takes his place ministering to the king and on behalf of the king. So what did they do? They transformed an evil plan and decree into a cause for a true celebration. They exposed that golden calf in Haman who tried to masquerade as the Holy One. He wanted to be worshiped. He was never concerned about the king, that the Jews were doing something the king didn't like, or that was subversive against the king. That was never in his mind. It was only in his mind that I'm offended with these Jews because this Jew will not bow down to me and show me the respect I believe I deserve. But the idea of the accuser like Haman or the serpent losing his place in heaven does have a context in Jewish thought. And I typed this out, I think word for word, um, and it's in reference to Yom HaKippur, or the day like Purim, a day like Purim, and it's coming from the Jewish tradition. It says, even the adversary attests to the righteousness of Israel. Our enemy is confounded and turned into our supporter. Remember, Haman is basically going to carry the evil of the decree off with him. That is the symbolism and the power of ketoret, the incense of taking the putrid smelling helbona and creating something pleasant. This is not a confusion of good and evil like the tree. That's my comment in the brackets. This is not a confusion of good and evil, but the creation of a different compound, an elevation of evil. Evil no longer impacts in a negative way. Rather, evil is co-opted to become an element of good. Remember Joseph telling his brothers, you intended this for evil, but there was a plan in place all along that's going to it's going to turn out to be deliverance and salvation and the redemption of our family relationship. So when there is repentance on Yom Kippur, then that which was evil is no longer going to impact us in a negative way. It's nullified and the evil becomes that element of good. And it takes those sins off with it. Let's see. So this murderous spirit of Amalek was from the beginning in the garden. And the beast seems and, you know, he wants to be a god. He wants to be seen as beautiful, as intelligent, as spiritual. And the beast might be beautiful, but only in a beastly way. He might be intelligent but only in a cunning, beastly way. And his spirit is not of our kind. But the beast wants to be worshiped as a god. It has no regard for human life or spiritual authority because he knew if he could deceive the human beings, they would tumble out of that garden basically of their own accord. They would murder themselves when they disobeyed the word. The beast, the spirit of Amalek, it's full of itself. It's violent, but it's only a matter of time until the fiery stones of the garden consume him. I'm going to show you the context for that. But if the serpent knows his time is short, 
perhaps he understands that he only has until an appointed time. Yom Kippur, or possibly Purim, there's hints to both. He has up until that particular point to deceive the world before his evil is transformed for all the righteous. It's going to flip the script. And so he has to work fast and he has to work hard to destroy as many people as he possibly can until Yom Kippur. Because the sages say, and I'm, I think it's in that same context. I don't know if I put it on a PowerPoint. Maybe I did, and I'll run into it. But the, the rabbis say that on Yom Kippur, even the adversary becomes our advocate. Even the adversary has to become our advocate, and he does that by carrying away our sin. He can't help himself. He has to be sent away. So, why was Esther the perfect filling stone, or firing stone, fiery stone, to avert the evil decree of Purim? She was from the tribe of Benjamin, or Judah. The text is ambiguous. But just remember, the temple was located on the territory where Judah and Benjamin met. They were situated on Benjamin's side. <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, today is... Um, Purim Katan. It'll be a month from now when Purim occurs. Because I think we're in Adar. I need to start reading my calendar better. But that temple was located at that intersection of their tribal territory, and the temple itself, it, it fell over on Benjamin's side. So it may be that what we're seeing in Revelation is part of a prophecy that we don't understand yet because maybe it's not yet happened. But we see that there will be a time and Benjamin and Judah are prophesying of this time as they work together, just like um, Judah trying to atone for Benjamin when they thought that he stole the silver cup now we're going to see a turnabout, a script flip again, where Benjamin is going to atone for Judah. But we see the plan of Amalek is going to be exposed and his evil will be transformed by the incense of prayer and repentance by the saints. And then salvation and deliverance follow that. We see that pattern when Queen Esther says, tell everybody to fast and pray for three days. Even though it's Pesach, he says, we have to fast and pray. We have to act as though it's the most serious Yom Kippur we've ever experienced. Three days, not one. Because see, on Yom Kippur is when you fast food and water. And she declares this during Pesach, during the days of unleavened bread, which reminds us again, we might be looking at seven Moedim, but they're really one. They will teach us different aspects, and frequently they will overlap or be chiastic in the way that they function together. But there's going to be an exposure of the plan, and it's transformed by incense, by ketorit. It's transformed by prayer and repentance, fasting, prayer. And of all the tribes, it was only Benjamin who didn't bow to Esau. You realize that? Uh, Rachel's still pregnant, but Benjamin wasn't born yet. So Benjamin couldn't voluntarily bow to Esau, the red one. He alone never bowed the knee to Uncle Esau. So we see the same thing in the case of Haman, the Amalekite. It was only Mordechai, the Benjamite who would not bow, no matter what. He would not bow his knee to Haman. And that's what the serpent wanted in the garden. He wanted not to be subdued by the human being, but to subdue. And in order to subdue him, he would have to murder him. Because that's going to be the result. 
you transgress the commandment, you die. So, and we see this is the, the ongoing pattern of anti-Semitism, which is the spirit of Amalek. And you'll generally see it, if we want to simplify it, it ranges between A, a belief that Jews should be, and we're saying Jews at this time because the tribes, some of them have been lost, but also from the other 10 tribes, the more righteous were absorbed into Judah after the deportation of Assyria because they wouldn't go up and worship at the alternate altars that Jeroboam set up. So the more righteous of the priests and the Levites and so forth migrated into the Jewish community to the point that they can still say, I'm a Benjamite. Or like Hannah, she can still say, I'm an Asherite. They still have a sense of their tribal ancestry, but especially by the first century, it's just a blanket statement. They're Jews, even if they still have tribal affiliation. Because remember, Judah was the fourth in birth order and four is the number of authority. So I think that's the royal bloodline comes from the fourth in birth order. So the belief is generally goes, okay, we have our Jews. We're the host country, we have our Jews, and we like for them to prosper because that way we can loot them at periodic intervals. And that's what the pattern of history has been. Jews have been allowed to come into a country, to thrive economically, and then basically the king cleans them out, borrows the money until the point where it's not going to be repaid, and then he kicks them out of the country, so he never has to repay it. So they're useful. The other extreme, I mean, sliding down that scale is absolute genocide. If you can't benefit me, then I'll kill you. And so if the Jews don't bow to plan A, then plan B goes into effect. You can see that in the pogroms and in inquisitions and in the, you know, they've been kicked out of England before. If you don't know Jewish history, it's just the repetition in every generation. The spirit of Amalek is perpetual because it's from the garden. And that's why we know that until a rod of iron in Yeshua's hand subdues the nations, the nations who are deceived by Amalek are never going to tolerate an independent Jewish or Israeli nation. They would never, they cannot. It is not within them. Just like Yeshua said, your father was a liar from the beginning. He can't tell the truth. These nations cannot accept an independent country, nation of Israel. It's anti everything the serpent teaches because the Jews are going to guard and protect the Torah, which is always going to preserve the story of the garden. And it's always going to expose the snake for what he was from the beginning. He can't have that evidence out there. He can't have that testimony out there. So let's look at the stone that was Benjamin. It was Yashve. Yashve. You can kind of hear like, if you substitute the J sound for the Y sound, which sometimes happens uh, in translation, you would get Jasper. So it's kind of like Jasper. Uh, the, the stone of Benjamin was Yashpe. And it can mean to polish something. And it, it was a multicolored stone. It had different colors, and so the rabbis say that the jasper or Benjamin stone, even though it was the last stone of the Choshen, because he was the last son born, that within the jasper is all the colors of the other stones. That in Benjamin, that stone represents every other tribe. And in that, both Judah and Benjamin are two tribes who can represent all the tribes. Judah, why? Because uh, representatives from all the other tribes of Israel, especially Shimon, were absorbed into Judah at some point in history. And then in Benjamin, the idea that as the last son, all the colors absorbed into the Jasper or the Yashpeh. 
that each would be able to represent the whole nation in some respect. And this will be cool when we uh, get to Revelation. So let's look at Ezekiel. I thought I put the, I guess I didn't. This is Ezekiel somewhere, chapter something. I didn't write it down. Nope, sure didn't. Okay, try to guess where I am. This is Ezekiel something, verse 12. As a son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. I mean, this is sounding like our garden, right? You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, the emerald, and the gold. There's our good gold. The workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. So he's describing what we've had in the past few Torah portions, the construction of the tabernacle and the garments of the high priest. He says, on the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed Karuv, cherub, who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. Who are the stones? Israel. We think Israel didn't come into being until Jacob was renamed. Israel was in Eden. And that's why Adam is sometimes referred to as the first king of Israel. It says, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, and that word there for trade is rakal. You think, my goodness, who was he trading with in the garden? So we're going to look at that word, rakal. And because of that, you were internally filled with violence. There's a root word you're familiar with, malu. Remember male, mala, miluim, perfections. Um, bringing to completion, you were filled with violence, malu hamas, which means he was completely filled up with murder. And you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering Keru, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. And part of that, I say, I don't remember which chapter this is in, but there's another chapter where it mentions how in that time to come, people are going to be able to walk by the accuser and look at him and say, what in the world is this? The one that made the tra nations tremble? This is it? People will finally realize they weren't helpless to overcome, that it wasn't that hard. So he did, he fulfilled an evil purpose, filled with violence. And notice in those, which I went through and looked up the Hebrew so you could, you didn't have to do that yourself. But he's mentioning, when he mentions these stones in the garden, the ones that I don't have the question mark over, those are mentioned in that passage in Ezekiel. So I looked up the corresponding tribe, and there's three tribes missing from that mention of the garden. That's the tribe of Gad, Naphtali, and Dan, which they would have been born in reverse order than when I've got them in English, because you're going right to left. So Dan missing, Naphtali missing, Gad missing. And I don't know that they were missing. It may be, again, the idea that they are not mentioned. It's giving us a... A hidden message, because Don means judgment, Naphtali means wrestling and striving, and then God is like the troop. The it also means a wall, by the way. It's like the root of a wall, and so we get an idea that there's going to be a judgment, there's going to be a struggle, and then there's going to be a wall or a, a victory by a troop, in some way. That would be something you could bring up at Bible study and get people started for an hour talking about why those three tribes aren't there. 
And there's a lot of debate on the identity of the king of Tyre. Is it referring to the first Adam? Is it Lucifer? Everybody's got an idea of who it was. And I don't really care at this point. Um, I just want to look at these stones. And what was he doing that was so evil? We know that he walked among the fiery stones. Why were they fiery? Well, remember the precious stones were within the rivers of Eden, which are fire. It's the burning rivers. Until he's cast out because of trade, recall. And that accusation is also made against Babylon in the book of Revelation. So again, we've got some bookends. Revelation, there's going to be recall. And over in Genesis, three, where it's describing what's going on in the garden, we have a, a transaction here. And here's what recall, which it's going to mean um, somebody who traffics or somebody who just goes about to traffic or somebody who goes about to slander. Now it starts making sense. What was the serpent doing? He can be going about for spice trade, according to Strong's definition, or he can be going about for slander. What does the incense do? It sweetens the sin when there's repentance. And so what does the high priest do? He prepares these spices for atonement. He's not using the spices as leverage to accuse Israel. He's using the spices as a way of atoning for the words of Israel. This being in Ezekiel, however, he has become a trafficker who is evidently going about to accuse or to slander Israel, to slander those in the garden. And does he have grounds to slander? Yes. And so that's why we need to be careful about telling everything we know and falling back on the excuse, well, it's true. <laughs> You're still a trafficker if there's not a specific reason for you to be passing on that information. If um, you're just throwing stuff out there uh, for the sake of slandering and subduing that person under you so that you can look greater, so that you don't have to be ruled by that person. Um, and, and you don't need an example. You can just turn on the news for 15 minutes and you get this, how people are trafficking in accusations, whether they're true or not. And they're using them as political leverage or financial leverage or military leverage. The high priest of Israel uses spices to atone, to bring repentance before the throne, not to accuse Israel. And it couldn't, that spice recipe for the anointing oil, it was holy, and it couldn't be shared with or prepared to be smeared on just anyone. So the priest going about is to atone for Israel, whereas this creature in Ezekiel's going about was to slander Israel. And you see an example in Kitisa where Moses begs forgiveness for Israel, even though he knows they've done wrong and he's going to have to judge those with the sword, those who have done wrong and who are guilty and unrepentant. But nevertheless, he says, if you're going to blot them out of your book, blot me out too. So what does he do? He atones. He tries to use words, incense, prayer of intercession to preserve Israel, not to accuse and to slander. And we see in that pattern in Vayagash, we saw how Judah atoned for Benjamin with words. And now in, in the book of Esther, Benjamin, Queen Esther, is going to atone for Judah. 
But that covering Karuv, whatever he was in the garden, he was self-idolatrous. He wanted to be worshipped. He wanted um, that R-E-S-P-E-C-T, right? Beyond the respect that we should have for the creation. He wanted the respect of Adonai himself. You can contrast that attitude or that character with the humility of Mordechai. He's not not bowing because he thinks he's better than Haman. He's not bowing because he knows Haman is not God. He recognizes the golden calf in Amalek. He recognizes that intent that was there from the garden. You see the humility, Queen Esther, she's the mother of 127 provinces. She's the mother of many nations. And yet she humbles herself and begins to intercede and to try to cover and to atone for an evil decree. And uh, of course the Jewish sages blamed the Arab Rab, the mixed multitude for the sin of the golden calf as the ones who slandered Moses with this man um, out of sight, out of mind with them. We don't know if that's true or not. That's the assertion. But in Esther, it's going to be the Jews from all tribes who were scattered among the Arab Rav. And then they're going to claim that they're Jews to escape the judgment that's going to come. So what's going on? Benjamin, that multicolored stone, trying to polish over a multitude of sin, but yet at the very same time reveal what we would call anti-Semitism, that murderous spirit of Amalek, to preserve Israel and at the same time to expose Amalek, to expose the accuser. And there's a that picture of Benjamin again on the on the left hand side. You can see the multicolored jasper stone or yashpe. Um, which gives us a whole new way of looking at the last shall be first. Um, in terms of Benjamin in this context, he was last for a reason because he's going to represent the glory of Jerusalem, especially the temple that was within his territory. And so his stone, because the temple was there in his territory, it needed to include all the colors of the others yet at the same time be very transparent. Because Benjamin will always represent those among the tribes who will not bow to the image of the beast. They will never bow. Revelation 21.10 says, He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. That's that yashpeh that represented Benjamin, that represented those among the tribes who would never bow to Esau, who would never bow to Amalek, who would never bow to the serpent. It had a great and high wall, which makes me think those three missing tribes in Ezekiel, they might be telling us something that we can figure out from Revelation. Like God representing a wall uh, or a troop. It says it had a great and high wall with 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. So gold is measuring gold at this point. The city's laid out as a square, and then we get down to verse 18. It says the material of the wall was jasper. Okay, that's got meaning now, it's got context. And the city was pure gold, like clear 
glass. Remember uh, the Zahav Tahor, the clean, the pure gold of the chain of the rope that connected us with the heavenlies, that sent our roots up into the heavenlies, and the good gold of the garden. He says, now the material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. So what was good gold? It was the city of Jerusalem. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper. So you see how it, he takes the last one, the jasper, the yashpet of Benjamin, and now it's the first foundation stone. What is the foundation of Benjamin? Benjamin did not bow to Esau. Benjamin did not bow to Amalek. That's what he symbolizes. That's what he represents. And then it goes on and it mentions the other 11 precious stones. And it says the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Just like you can see the streets moving between the Hoshan stones on the breastplate. So what should we remember about the tribe of Benjamin? Don't bow to Amalek. Don't bow to Esau. Uh, remember the temple. Remember where you're going. Don't sacrifice temporary security for this eternal glory. Because that's what it talks about is the glory of this place. Um, I saw no temple. The, there's no sun or moon to shine. It says, for the glory of God has illumined it and its lamp is the lamb. Nations walk by its light and so forth. Nothing unclean can come in there. And it even mentions the book of life. And Kitisa, Moses, like, if you're going to blot them out of your book, blot me out. So there's context here. But just going back up to verse 11, the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. Benjamin, the Yashpe, when we don't bow to Amalek, we are shining the glory of Adonai. Now, it doesn't mean Amalek's going to like that. It's going to draw attention to us, and he's going to try plots and plans when we do that. Esther 3, 1 says, after these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, who was an Amalekite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. So you see how he's playing right into that root sin of the serpent, not wanting to submit to authority, but wanting to be the authority. And so the king is playing right into his hands. It says, all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordechai neither bowed nor paid homage. And then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordechai, why are you transgressing the king's command? Do you see the parallels there? Mordechai is not transgressing the king's command. Mordechai is keeping the king of kings' command. And when you keep the king of kings' command, sometimes it means that you will have to transgress an earthly king's demand. And that's the way Amalek sets it up. He will try to set you in opposition with natural earthly authority. And push you into a corner where you can't wiggle around. And in this case, Mordechai couldn't wiggle around it. He's not going to bow to Amalek. And therefore, it's going to set him in opposition with an earthly king. But from the garden, it's always been about authority with the serpent. And the Jews, Israel, Benjamin, 
the righteous among those, however we take our sets and subsets, those who will not bow to Amalek are those who discern what happened in the garden and understand it's still happening. There are still those out there who are trying to frame you, set you up, deceive you, talk you into or talk you out of bowing only to the king of kings. Has nothing to do with respect. Respect is you do owe respect to human beings and even creatures. They also are considered your neighbor. You have to have respect for the creation, but you don't worship the creation. You are to rule over it in a benevolent way, just like the father does. And so Mordechai would not bow. And I want you to notice the grammar of this in Hebrew. And those of you who are enrolled in the Hebrew class, you're going to appreciate this uh, eventually. But the text says that Mordechai would not bow, past, present, or future. Look what it does here. Um, it's not translated properly in English where it says, but Mordechai neither bowed down nor paid homage. If you see those words there in the Hebrew text, lo yikra, he would not bow down. That means he will not bow down. Ve yishtachave, he will not kneel. He won't. It's future tense. What is it telling you? Mordechai, the Benjamite, did not bow to Esau in the past. Mordechai is not bowing to Haman in the present, nor will he ever bow in the future to Haman, to the one who is substitu substituting himself for the tree. Instead, he is introducing only confusion. Mordechai will never bow, it says, future tense. So we know Benjamin dwells between the shoulders of Hashem. He bows to the authority of that name and to the king of kings alone. Benjamin will not bow to the serpent. He will not bow to the satanic forces of Azazel that we become aware of on Yom Kippur. He will not bow to Haman. He will not bow to spiritual confusion. Not then, not now, not ever. What sets apart Benjamin? He desired the temple. The Holy One knew that one day that temple would have to be built in someone's territory. And it had to be put in the territory of someone who would not bow that there would always be a remnant. And that's what Benjamin represents to us, that remnant of Israel that is not going to bow. He goes back to his father, Jacob, who desired a temple. Esau, it says, despised his birthright because of what it represented. He would have to be the, the priest of the family, basically. It meant that he would have to surrender the authority over his life and surrender it to heaven. And you guys know the difference. When you start walking in the word and you start developing a relationship with, the, with Yeshua, at some point you realize your life is not your own anymore. You don't truly set your own daily schedule. Little by little, he takes that away from you. And you have less and less say about how your days go and how your weeks go and how your years go. Because all of a sudden, you're rotating around his will. So, okay, I've got Hebrew class on Sunday. Or I go clean my fellowship on Sunday. I have Torah class on Monday or Tuesday. Um, I take care of my parents on this day. I'm a caregiver. And, and, you know, we've all got different blends of that. Some people, they are caregivers 24-7. And they are fulfilling their purpose. They are fiery stones. 
they're smoking. Whatever he has put in your life to do, whatever your calling is, all you got to remember is to pull that bowstring back every day as hard as you can to hit the mark, to male, to fulfill your purpose. And so your days are spent thinking about Shabbat, studying the Torah portion. What am I going to prepare for Shabbat? all of a sudden you've got less and less ownership over your life, which is what he wanted to begin with. He wants to set your calendar. And you can, at some point, if you will compare your schedule today in this walk to someone who has no thought of heavenly things, only of having authority right now, authority over their own lives, over their own vacation times, over their own holidays, over the television shows they watch and the movies they go to and the songs they listen to and the things they do with their children or the things they do with their grandchildren. Compare your life to theirs, not to be proud, but simply to show you the difference and what it means to be a Benjamite and what it means to be an Amalekite who lives only to serve themselves and to have authority over everything around them. Jacob was willing to serve and to, to function in his life around the purpose that the father put into his life, what it meant for Jacob to be a precious stone in his generation. Esau had no intention of fulfilling that purpose of a family priest or fathering a nation of priests or fathering a son like Levi and priests would just, he didn't have any interest in, he wanted to marry who he wanted to marry, he wanted to live where he wanted to live, he wanted to eat what he wanted to eat, he wanted to do it when he wanted to do it. He never surrendered his life to heaven. And when you won't surrender your life to heaven, you cannot dwell between his shoulders. You just can't. Because the one who dwells between his shoulders, that was the blessing on Benjamin. He will dwell between his shoulders. It's talking about the temple. But also imagine the breastplate. And being one of those fiery stones from the garden that has fulfilled and filled up your purpose, you are smoking hot. And the wicked can't walk with you. You'll burn them up. <laughs> that smoke will burn them up. And being part of those precious stones, whichever one you are, fulfilling your purpose in your life, what are you doing? You're being like your father Jacob, who knew that it would there was a cost for not living according to his own authority, but instead according to the authority of the one who had planned his life. The potential was there for either Esau or Jacob, either one of them. They had the same potential, but it says that Esau despised that birthright. He despised the idea of anybody telling him what to do, setting rules, setting boundaries that ultimately were put into place for resurrection, for eternal life. He preferred a temporary physical life to an eternal spiritual life and reward. Okay, I see Maxlin found it. Ezekiel 28, 12. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 